Well, hey guys, welcome back to Let's Talk About It with Jackie and Megan. Megan, how's your week been? How's life? Busy. We took a couple weeks off Good. because Megan was sick and then she was out of yeah. town. So. Yeah, I was a troublemaker. Yeah. With my Megan was cold. It was I don't think anyone would have wanted to hear me like sniffling in their ear though. So. No, we it did was, record. It was really sacrificial of me. Yeah, we did record a podcast once when I was getting over COVID and I felt better for sure, but I didn't notice how much I was like sniffling and then I was hearing the <laughs> audio back and it was horrible and never again. So, um, and plus yeah, I had to like, yeah, I already have a low voice, but when I'm sick, right. it sounds like a man. So everyone would been like Jackie and Megan, more like Jackie and Michael, <laughs> Michael, <laughs> Yeah, so we did not subject you to that, and you got a couple weeks off from us, but today we're coming back, and we are doing a very much requested video. We are going to talk about justification, Protestant versus Catholic, and yeah, it's going to be good, I think. Yeah, obviously there are much more theologically educated people out there who have these conversations but if you're interested oh. in on the ground two friends talking about their views then this is for you and I don't know about you Jackie but as I was thinking about this I was just thinking about how I grew up only hearing really one view and it wasn't until I was older that I even realized that like Catholics have a completely different view of justification or not completely different but different and so it's even hard for me to like conceptualize what your position is because I'm just so not familiar. Yeah. I'm sure you feel the same way. So I think this will be fun too, just to even ask questions out of like genuine curiosity. Yeah. When I first, so yeah, I would was raised in a very Catholic centric community, everything. And I'd never heard the phrase, I was saved until yeah. I moved to Chicago and I started working in a ministry with only Protestants. I was the only Catholic there. And yeah, um, I remember she's one of my good friends now, Haley. And she was saying, yeah, I was saved when I was 16. I was like, what are you talking about? I've yeah. never heard that in my entire life. And she didn't know. She's like, oh, really? You like, you don't, you've never heard that or you don't use that language. Um, so that was definitely an eye opener for me. I remember I kept hearing her say it and then to ask her, I was like, what do you mean you were saved? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and it's so funny how we have different like different little session. phrases. Like I remember when yeah. I was working at a Catholic organization where I met you, I kept hearing people say prayer intentions instead of prayer requests. Uh -huh. And I was like, intention, what does that mean? So it's just funny how we have like the different like sayings that we just take for granted. Everyone knows what we mean, but that's not always true yeah well we're gonna start off with Megan let's go on to share um a more Protestant view of justification which we do recognize there's not like it's not exactly the same for every Protestant um but I do feel like your view is definitely a very popular one and what most most people would see it as so yeah I'm probably more mainline evangelical yeah so Megan, my first question is just, oh, what is boy. your definition of justification? Yes. So as I was thinking about this question, I was, I wanted to clarify it a little bit because obviously we both believe in justification, which is how sinners are made righteous before God. What really comes down to is the means of justification or how that takes place that's sort of where the difference lies. So that would be a point of common ground. We can both agree that justification is sinners being made right with God. Um, Protestants, what we believe about justification sort of consists in two parts. So this is from Calvin. Ooh, oh no. Uh, in, in the Institutes, he says that it consists of two parts, the remission of sins and the imputation of Christ's righteousness. So there's sort of those two parts. So in justification, sins are forgiven and righteousness is 
credited to the believer. We get that from Romans 4, 6 through 8. Um, Martin Luther actually called it an alien righteousness, right? Because it's not something that we have innately. It is something being applied to us. So justification is based wholly on the person and work of Jesus Christ. The guilt of all humanity was transferred to Jesus on the cross, and he paid that price by receiving the due punishment of death. So just like our sin was transferred to Jesus, we believe then that his righteousness is transferred to us. And this is something that Luther refers to as the wondrous exchange, where Christ takes our sins and gives us his righteousness. It's this like very beautiful, precious thing. So God is then able to justify sinners, something that would be unjust, right? It would not be just for God to just look at us and be like, I'll pretend your sin doesn't exist, or I'll just like look away or turn a blind eye. That would not be righteous or just, but he's then able to do that now on the grounds of Christ's death because God considers our sin as belonging to Jesus, and he now sees Jesus's righteousness belonging to us. So in this way, Jesus is both our substitute and representative. So that's why we believe it's sort of this one-time exchange, because it's not necessarily the reality, right? Like we're not fully righteous yet. There's a now and not yet reality, but God is considering us righteous because when he looks at us, he sees Jesus. And then as we are sanctified throughout our lives and eventually we go get to heaven and are fully glorified, that's when we are fully then righteous. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. I would say that's probably a pretty common view over most Protestant traditions. It's very like Lutheran mm -hmm. reformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say that we also believe there is like a forensic declara declaration that follows the remission of sins and also that like a very similar definition. Um but that's what we would call, which we'll get more into with mine, your initial justification. <laughs> Whereas, mm. yeah, so we'll get more into that. But I would say that there's a lot there that Catholics would agree with, um, especially in initial justification or like the ways in which we are justified. It's all like, you know, Christ taking on our sins and us taking on his, his righteousness. Um, which is why so, we don't need to view each other as heretics. <laughs> right similar <laughs> it's just and we'll get into it more that it's different but similar mm -hmm. so, so also something that is different between the two of us is um like when do you believe justification happens in a person's life so i think yeah the biggest distinction between the two that you could see even just from a practical standpoint, or I don't know, is the timing of it and how mm -hmm. it actually all plays out. So our, cause our definitions are similar, but the timing. So when would you believe the justification happens in a specific person's life? Yes. Um, I think this would be across the board, Protestant denominations. It is when a person places faith in the saving work and person of Jesus Christ. So that's what we would call when you're saved, right? It's when you place your faith in Jesus, you accept Jesus as your savior and repent of your sins. Um, and in that moment, you're joined to Christ. So being united to Christ is like a huge part of this doctrine, right? Because we're then justified because we're joined to Christ. His righteousness is applied to us. And those who are joined to Christ then receive the benefits of salvation, which includes sanctification, which would be what we would consider holy living, right? Becoming more righteous, regeneration, a new heart, a heart that wants to become more righteous and actually wants to follow God and please him and love him. And then also the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right? Believers have the Holy Spirit in us to convict us, to comfort us, and to guide us. Yeah. And so you think that's something that happens in that moment like instantaneously yes so mm -hmm. that's something for catholics that is just going to be like what are you talking about the language i saved <laughs> yeah that's that is something that would be like totally foreign to me um and i remember even asking like 
which maybe you'd have an answer to this, but asking my friend, Hey, like, well, what does that look like? And I understand because it's so specific to each person that it would like look differently, like that moment in each person's life, even since you think it happens in a moment, which is like something so like out of my thinking. Like I just, yeah, it's very not the way that I think about justification. Um, so for you, like, would you say it ha- it's different for each person, like what it looks like or what it has to involve or what does one have to do to receive justification? Yeah, I think it, it depends on the person and each of us have sort of a different journey there. Um, I think that's why it's common in Protestant traditions to talk about our testimony, right? Because we lean heavily on the beauty of this moment when there's like a, a turning. You were at a crossroads and you chose to turn, right? Um, now, some traditions would say that that was because you were predestined to turn. That, like that gets into a whole other right. conversation. Yeah, it's a whole other conversation. Yeah, <laughs> um, about free will and God's sovereignty and all of that. So that gets super complicated. Um, but yeah, it can definitely look different for each person. Like you were saying, your friend who is who became a Christian in high school, that's going to look different than someone like me who grew up in a Christian home. And most likely that happened when I was a very, very young child because I sort of always believed God existed. And it was more of a slow process of coming to accept him as my personal savior, right? So I think it can look different for each person. It's not like a a magical, like, oh, when it happens, you start glowing and this feeling occurs. Um, But I think what what we would say is what accompanies that moment of receiving justification is naturally sanctification and you will start showing fruits of the spirit. So obviously we don't stop sinning, but we should start being grieved by our sin. We should start repenting. We should start desiring to follow God and to be like him. So those come along with it, which would be the evidence of that taking place in your life. Right. And so another question to follow up, which this also can get more into predestination and all of that, um, but a very common question because Protestants do have different views on this of, do you think you can lose your salvation once you're justified? So you have that moment, like, because for Protestants, it's like, okay, this one moment you're justified you're made right with god and then it's a process of sanctification as time goes on from that justification um but could someone like decide you were really young megan when you decided you wanted to be a christian and then i don't know something happens and later in life and you just go off the rails and you start just you just don't go to church anymore you don't believe in god you start sinning like crazy (laughs) and of course, like the, yeah, the Catholic question, or I think like the concern a lot of times for Catholics was people saying like, oh, that's when I was saved is, well, that doesn't mean you're just done. Like you're done. And then that, that's, that saves, that's everything's done for you then. And you can do whatever you want. Um, like, couldn't you make that decision and then go back on it or, mm-hmm. you know, sin so grievously that against the Lord, or I don't know, something like that. So would you say, that you can actually lose your justification lose is would be a weird word to use but that is what i feel like i hear people ask with yeah. that question for sure um yeah i think that's where the critiques happen uh protestants say that catholics believe in justification through works and yeah. catholics feel that protestants have sort of an easy believism like wow you just like say the jesus prayer and you're good to go and you get you let anyone in. you let anyone in right <laughs> yeah <laughs> I just letting anybody in here now sure. <laughs> uh, yeah and I think it is an important thing to note that different denominations do sort of have a slightly different view on this so like for Lutherans justification can be lost with a loss of faith for if I'm understanding it correctly Catholics and Orthodox it can be lost by committing a mortal sin that's an oversimplification um Methodist traditions I was reading that they have what is called conditional security. So salvation can be lost with a loss of faith that Mm. accompanies sin. Mm. And then the reformed traditions 
um, justification cannot be lost. It's called mm-hmm. eternal security. Mm-hmm. And it is understood that because our justification is wholly a work of our faith in God, that God is making a covenant that he cannot break or go back on, which is why you can't lose your salvation. So all that to say, where do I fall? <laughs> I think this is probably an area where you and I are closer than we might expect. Um, I think my clarification would be, I think lose is the wrong word. And I know that's not a critique on you. That's the word people use when they say this, but I believe someone can reject their justification or salvation. So just like we don't Mm -hmm. work our way into salvation, I don't think we can sin our way out of salvation. I think someone can wander and sin grievous, grievously and come back. Um, I think we see that in the prodigal son. We see that throughout scripture. So just like justification is a free gift given to us, you can reject a gift. You can even receive a gift and then throw it away later. So I think around this topic, there just needs to be a lot of pastoral care because a lot of people, and I know I've spoken to people personally, have a lot of anxiety around losing their salvation, which is very understandable. I would say you cannot accidentally lose your salvation. You cannot wake up one day and accidentally be on your way to hell. Um, You don't need to worry about that. Scripture is very clear uh, in Philippians 1, 6, that God will complete his good work in you that he started and that nothing can separate us from God in Romans 8, 38 through 39. So God is making a covenant with us when he declares us righteous and is viewing Jesus's work on the cross is applying to us. God does not break his covenants. Now we can knowingly reject our salvation and turn away from God. And that's what we see as apostasy, right? So lots of people nowadays will decide I'm no longer a Christian. I no longer believe in God, but this is, it's different than, and that's why I feel like losing your salvation is sort of a confusing term because this is an intentional act of rebellion. Yeah. So we don't, yeah, I just feel like losing your salvation causes a lot of anxiety because it sounds like, or, you know, losing something is like an accident. You don't intend to do that. This would be yeah. very intentional. Um, I heard an analogy like years ago of a married couple, right? So we wouldn't want to have anxiety in our marriage. Like every day I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, what if one day I accidentally divorce John? Like, what if one day I just leave him? Like, what if our marriage ends? I shouldn't worry about that, right? We have made a commitment. We've made a covenant. We have vows. That's not something that would accidentally happen. That would be me intentionally making that decision. I am going to leave you and then break that covenant. So obviously this could be like an entire podcast episode because we could get into like the nitty gritty of eternal security and God's role and our role. But I think that would just probably be my answer to that is you cannot lose your salvation, but you can knowingly reject it. Yeah. Yeah. And that I think is really good clarity. And I would say is closer to the Catholic view versus a very reformed view. I think that's where we would see like a very big difference between the Catholic view of justification and the Protestant view is like very Calvinist, hard Calvinist slash reformed view of justification. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely where it would be like, I just absolutely really no similarities. I shouldn't say no similarities, but very different. Um, another thing that I think is different between Catholics and Protestants is our distinctions between justification and sanctification. This is a big one too. So for Protestants, how do you view the difference between justification and sanctification, how those work together? Yes, uh, they definitely work together. One cannot exist without the other. But I would say that justification, the doctrine is not about a change of our nature. It's about our status before God. Mm-hmm. So that God viewing us as righteous and crediting Christ's righteousness to us. So anyone who is has been justified will produce good works as a product of faith. 
and as a result of the grace that God is giving us through sanctification. That is the natural result of being justified. You cannot be justified and then not believe in God, not follow him, not be a Christian, not grow in godliness. So sanctification then is the outworking of our justification, how we live into our justification, and it's our growth in personal holiness. So sanctification is distinct, but it always accompanies justification. Um, This is where we get the idea of saint and sinner at the same time. It's a very Lutheran (laughs) uh, phrase. But Christians are saints and sinners, saints because we are holy in God's eyes for Christ because of Christ and do works that please him and also sinners because we continue to sin until we die and are glorified. Yeah. And I think there, this is not mainstream at all. And this is, but you will see some, um, like very off, like niche Protestants, like very just, I would not even, I would not say they at all represent most of Protestantism, but they will say that once you're justified, you cannot sin. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm which yeah. is interesting but it's definitely not the generally like, like the popular protestant view yeah and there's definitely um there's branches of certain denominations there's actually one uh, we call it the, like the second blessing heresy so it is considered a heresy that you will actually become sinless <laughs> and there are people who believe that and it's funny because they're like obviously sinning and they would just say no i'm not (laughs) yeah like what what do you mean (laughs) yeah i'm like can we take a look at your life like from day to day and they're like no i don't sin (laughs) like oh okay um yeah so that is a, a like a distinct that's a heresy um I know some people get confused with like wesleyanism and a lot of methodist traditions Mm. because they do believe that it's possible to throughout your life experience sanctification and actually reach that full holiness before death they believe it's possible uh that i think is is much different that's not technically considered a heresy (laughs) because it's not like a requirement (laughs) right or like that it will happen and they will probably even say like we haven't seen it but it can you know (laughs) because Yeah, because I don't think I've definitely not seen one human that doesn't at least have some sin, even if it's minor on earth or is perfectly patient and kind and all of that. Um, Yes, that is definitely where Jesus was unique. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) um, he definitely, we're we're different in that way, you know, just just that way. He was different than other guys. Um, (laughs) That's where that fully God really comes in, you know? Yes. Uh, so I know that there's going to be uh, like questions about, so what is faith, like what does having faith mean, especially in the context of sola fide? So which you can explain that more to what that, what that phrase means, because that also is a very distinctly Protestant phrase and was part of the Reformation. Um, so what is faith, like what does that mean in that context? Yeah, uh, I think this would be a difference between Protestants and Catholics is Catholics sort of view this doctrine in and of itself coming out of the Reformation, where we see it as the Reformation rediscovering this doctrine. So that would be a difference in how we like view church history in a way. But Protestants believe that the Reformation rediscovered God's justification of sinners by faith in Christ alone without human deeds or church administrations. Uh, so Luther founder of the reformation outlined five solas or five alones that he felt described our salvation experience and it is through by god's grace alone through our faith alone in christ alone to god's glory alone with scripture alone being the ultimate authority for this truth and i know you were when we were preparing for this asking about like what about the role of baptism which i think was such an interesting uh question because that's something back when we talked to dr ortland about baptismal regeneration and infant baptism like that gets in that whole conversation so obviously 
you would see that initial justification occurring at baptism, but we wouldn't necessarily see it that way. Um, I guess that's different between different traditions, though, because Lutherans do hold to baptismal regeneration. I'm not going to speak to that, though, because I'm not Lutheran, so I don't know. <laughs> but how I would say the role of baptism plays a part in our salvation is that it's an outward expression of an inward reality. Um, I think that's how sacraments work. Uh, so it's showing that someone has entered the kingdom of God and in the sacrament of baptism, they receive sanctifying grace from God. So someone who's getting baptized is already a Christian because we believe that the sacraments are for Christians, just like someone who is not a Christian should not partake in the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas Catholics would see that baptism is your initial justification through ordinary means, like the ordinary way of going about it, because there's also, which we could get into more like baptism of desire of like, well, I never got to be baptized and I died, but I truly really desired to be like, okay, there's baptism of desire, but through ordinary means, your initial justification is in your baptism. So that's like the introductory sacrament that invites you into the Christian life, um, but that also, yes, that is a totally different, <laughs> that could be an entirely different episode, but I think definitely goes hand in hand because yeah, for Catholics, um, it just goes to show how much these things are connected and why yes. it makes sense that like, I would not believe in baptismal regeneration and you would like, it, it makes sense. Then when you start digging through and breaking down these yeah. different doctrines. Yeah, it makes sense. It definitely, yeah. Kind of I like, wanted to real quick to talk about faith alone because obviously this would right. be like the contention point. So, mm -hmm. and I know there's a lot of like misconceptions about it. So I just wanted to sort of break down like what it means and what it doesn't mean. <clears throat> so what it means is that God justifies the one who believes in Jesus. Romans 3, 26 and Romans 5, 1. Faith, what is faith? Faith is a reliance on Jesus whose person and work is revealed in scripture Faith is simply the channel or the empty hand that receives God's free gift of salvation. Um, Luther actually describes it as a self-despairing trust, which I found really interesting. And our justification is not on the basis of our faith, but it's through or by our faith. Because if it was on the basis of our faith, that would be a work, right? <laughs> Placing your faith is a work. So it's through or by, not on the basis of. What it doesn't mean is that saving faith is an acceptance that we've been justified like an eternity past or something like that would be universalism, right? We're just recognizing our status. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. Um, saving faith is not believing in justification by faith alone, which is why I can recognize you as a fellow Christian, <laughs> even though you don't hold the same doctrine as me. And saving faith is not a work that we do in order for God to accept us. So he doesn't justify us because he sees our faith as a sign of like our change of attitude. It's Jesus who is the object of our faith. Is He is the basis of our justification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely is different than our view <laughs> in, in a way. <laughs> um yeah i think it would be similar i mean we both would agree um that we're not declared righteous by our good works but the mm -hmm. good works that god gives it's it's different in that we would say that our good works can merit things for us that's why our justification is ongoing but that they're only possible through the grace that god gives us so Mm -hmm. Our good works separated from faith, which we would agree with James there, do nothing um, and can merit nothing. We can merit nothing without God's grace, but there is that free will and that choice of like accepting the grace that God gives us to do and then to be able to do those good works throughout our lives, which through time does justify us. So that that's where it is different. Um, it's like, because I would say, well, it is kind of faith alone. Like all of my, I would... <laughs> say, well, I would agree with faith alone, but not in the way that Protestants do, because I would say that 
you know, all of my good works, they only flow from my faith. Like I have to continually have faith that like God is like giving me the grace to do that. Or like, I can't just work my way to salvation without faith, if that makes sense. Um, but it's I think different. that's why yeah, people argue a lot about James. Yeah. Like, you know, I think that's a common objection, like uh, faith alone, well, faith without works is dead. And what I would say is that that's a misunderstanding or not proper exegesis of James. What James is teaching is that faith is not a mere acceptance of facts because even demons can accept facts. Demons can believe that God exists and even shudder. They can fear him. And that's not faith, right? Right. A faith that embraces Jesus for justification is one that will have fruit of a righteous life. And we would both agree with that. We would agree yeah. that you cannot just earn your way into God's presence without having faith. And you cannot have faith that results in no fruit in your life at all. That would yeah. not be true faith. That would not. Yeah. Right. And I know, so there was a an article I was reading where I was talking about the demonstrative versus declarative meanings in the Bible where they say to justify. So there would be demonstrative, which is just dem is demonstrated versus declarative being declared upon you and sort of that distinction. Um, so for example, Abraham and Rahab were justified or shown to be righteous by their works, but were not declared righteous by our good works, but the good works that God gives believers to do to demonstrate the righteous position in Christ. So we would say that justification is that declarative meaning of to justify. And then we right. demonstrate it in our sanctification. Yeah. And we would say the same thing about like initial justification, <laughs> which there is the difference is that, yeah. Um, yeah, like it's, we are being declared without really doing anything uh, justified in God in our initial justification. Um, and just like receiving that grace, it's completely um, unmerited I mean and it, that even makes sense in the fact that a lot of babies when they're baptized they're babies so <laughs> they're not like being like hey I'm gonna choose um to follow Christ that initial justification of like coming into the community and then that's why it makes sense that that's not just one and done like justification for us because a lot of times it is when you're a baby so then it's like you have to grow and then grow in those virtues and accept that grace and continue to like to grow and accept the graces that you were given in your initial initial justification um and the good works that flow from that um which i guess kind of leads into megan asking me more about the catholic view of yes before that though i'm just curious what would be your like your concerns or main objections to the protestant view like before we get into what you believe what would just be like your main like yeah sorry don't buy it <laughs> oh yeah I think for me um I think it really comes down to that like justification and sanctification I think like <clears throat> for me it just makes more sense that our justification our sanctification are intertwined and that there's more of like an everyday being saved like we kind of see it as I'm saved yesterday I'm saved today and I'm being saved like God is saving me it's not this one and done salvation um and I think it just makes it makes more sense to me that it's not just this one this one moment that you'd make that decision it's that we are just continually being converted internally and I think that that goes with our justification um which outwardly looks very much what looks very similar <laughs> um in both of our views which is what's funny is that it looks very similar and you wouldn't really be able to be like well you know um yeah I think that that's why I just don't I just don't agree with that one moment of that you are that in which you are justified and that I think it it goes it keeps um going and then also if you bring into like the role of the sacraments <laughs> then it gets even more like I think the sacraments are something that we should be partaking in and that continually continually are part of our salvation so that's also where there would be the distinction too um 
And I also uh, very much believe in the role of the sacramental confession and that Mm -hmm. being a huge role in your, um, your justification slash sanctification in life and receiving God's grace in that way. So there's a lot tied into it. Um, Yeah. That is why I would disagree with the Protestant view. Um, But I definitely much more logically see how it is a view that you can logically hold which as before Mm -hmm. I was like what the heck are they talking about like you were saved like what do you mean um (laughs) and now I'm like okay well that like I don't agree with it but I see I can see how someone like believes that um which obviously like it's not just these fringe groups that are holding this it's like an entire section of the Christian world of people that believe you know in faith alone. Um, so it, it does make sense to me, even if I disagree with it, if that makes sense, which yeah. is a beautiful thing of growing in friendship with people that disagree with you or just like opening yourself up to those views because it makes sense. Mm-hmm. And the funniest thing to me is in actual, in our, like in our Christian life, it like does look very similar, like the progression of a person. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So I think and why are- a faithful Catholic and a faithful Protestant will both be growing in holiness. <laughs> yeah. And I would say that we can have a pretty good, and I think yeah, the tying of like mortal sin comes in there too. Like we mm. can have a pretty good assurance of our salvation, even though we don't have that like eternal security kind of view or like think that once we're justified, as long as we just keep like having faith and don't apostatize that we will be saved. It's that it's, we can have a pretty good surety of our salvation, even though we can't first, like we recognize we're continually being justified, but just knowing that God honors that desire to be with him and like that mercy and that like continual, like receiving of the sacraments. And like, if I do think I've morally sinned, like just going to confession or even the, like, if I don't receive confession, it's like, well, there's that you know, baptism by desire or like forgiveness by that desire and knowing that God is a just God and a merciful God and wants us to be in heaven, (laughs) that he's not just waiting. You messed up on this very technical thing that you did and you didn't go to confession. Like, no, we know that these are the ordinary means with which God works in our lives, the sacraments, Mm -hmm. but God certainly can work outside of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And does, and there's going to be salvation for people that you wouldn't even know and probably lived a terrible life and then on their deathbed or they make that profession of faith and you know god will want to invite them into his you know eternal salvation so yeah i think that's where why these two views even though we're different why we can kind of like co i mean yeah why we don't call the other a heretic <laughs> and why yeah. in a lot and of i just ways, think of too like yeah. the thief on the cross how it causes problems for both traditions right mm-hmm. and i think yeah christ looking at the thief on the cross and saying today you will be with me in paradise uh that is something we have to wrestle with right like you were saying it's a very like it's a deathbed confession it's a deathbed conversion and it definitely complicates things um but I think that's why it's fun to have these conversations. Yeah. See, for me, like, like personally, for me, it doesn't complicate. I think it, I'm like, oh, thank God, you know, like that's, yeah. that's such a good thing to see. And just knowing that God, like he wants us in heaven with him and has this like merciful view. And um, I think that's why, that's why very hard, which this, we will not get into this because Megan knows I have very strong feeling, but why very like hard double predestination view or like that kind of that like really irks me because I just think that God like every soul he's created he wants to be in heaven with him even Mm -hmm. though they don't all choose that (laughs) right um yeah but um but your view Jackie your turn to be in the hot seat (laughs) I think well just to be fair fair is fair uh what would you say is the means of justification in Catholic doctrine? When or how is it received? Yes. So justification, we would say, is the act that reconciles man to God and frees him from sin. And the Catholic Catechism reads Article 1987. 
The grace of the Holy Spirit has the power to justify us, that is, to cleanse us from our sin and to communicate to us the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus, in Jesus Christ and through baptism. So typically your initial justification, which I've said, happens at baptism. That's when I believe I was baptized as a baby, raised as a Catholic, um, happens as uh, typically as an infant. And of course, there's um, we believe that that initial justification comes freely from the grace of God. Um, and then, of course, baptism is the ordinary means, but there's also baptism by desire. Um, God can work outside of the sacraments. And um, Catechism Article 1992 says, Justification has been merited for us by the passion of Christ, who offered himself on the cross as a living victim, holy and pleasing to God, and whose blood has become the instrument of atonement for the sins of all men. Justification is conferred in baptism, the sacrament of faith. It conform conforms us to the righteousness of God, who makes us inwardly just by the power of his mercy. Its purpose is the glory of God and of Christ and the gift of eternal life. And I guess that's where I would say the justification, there's the initial justification. So it is both forensic and intrinsic. That is the person really does become righteous, like initially when they are, uh, that initial justification is like a forensic, like I don't want to say imputation because we don't quite use that, but like on the person, but then there's, there's your ongoing justification, which is where it's different in the Protestant view that we have initial justification and then um, ongoing justification um, that is infused with like, with the, as you're infused with the virtues that it's ongoing. Um, so I guess that makes sense because our view of initial justification is very much the same as what you would just call that one moment of justification, that it's like entirely merited by Jesus on the cross and him giving us his righteousness by his blood. So I think a question coming out from that would be, because obviously I would say that I would have to like place my faith in Christ, but obviously the baby being baptized is most likely not even aware of what's going on. So what faith is happening? And would it be the faith of the parents then? Mm -hmm. And that's why for us, it's not just like this one and done thing and that initial justification, because you have to then you receive. So in your initial justification, like you are saved from sin in that before that you had no, it didn't matter what you did, what good works you did. Like you really had no opportunity to, be freed or saved from sin without Jesus's, you know, like crucifixion and giving you that. So in that, in your baptism, you know, in these ordinary means, you are receiving that justification to give you the opportunity to, you know, be in heaven with Christ. Um, and so you're infused with those graces. Um, and it's, a, you know, a entirely free gift from God of faith, hope, and joy. Um, and I mean, it, yeah, it's definitely by the faith of your parents and they are promising to raise you in a Catholic home. And then your godparents, like the purpose actually is if your parents were to die, your godparents would be there to step in and raise you and educate you in the Catholic faith. Um, and so then your ongoing justification is continue to grow and to live into those virtues and let those virtues grow within you and that grace within you um, that God has put within you in that baptism to continually grow. And then you further receive sacraments um, as you get older. Uh, some will actually receive their Eucharist on the, the Eastern tradition when they're babies as well. So they don't have to have their first communion. Like I couldn't receive until I was in second grade, but babies can start receiving communion because they're technically, you know, they're Christians mm -hmm. um, and they're being raised in a Christian home and they are. Yeah. So there is, huh. yeah, so that is, I know, very different from the Protestant view because they're already considered Christians as little babies without them giving this, like, de declaration of faith. Um, and then as you get older, then, you know, you have your first communion. And then a lot of times, like, receiving your confirmation, that's when you really, like, that's when I remember having my first moment of, like, really... Well, first communion was a really beautiful moment for me too. I was in second grade, so I was older, but really like coming to understand and start to really like live into that grace and like understand the grace that God was giving me and present in my life. And I mean, that's because you're like, that's when you're like fifth, sixth grade, um, at least for me. 
some people can confirm in second grade too. There's no like dogma, like the, where, how your sacraments have to go, except for the baptism is first and should be when you're a baby. Yeah. So it's just like, it's very different. <laughs> yeah. The CC so obviously, was just, what was she? She was dedicated. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in infant baptism. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm a credo Baptist believer's baptism. Right. So if she does decide to get baptized, it will be when she decides to, but she was dedicated, which in our church means that it's, it's more John and I committing to raise her as a Christian and mm -hmm. it's the church committing to come alongside us in that endeavor. Yeah. So. And I would say like, oh, this will come up later. So I'll just let Megan keep asking her questions. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, obviously we talked about the distinction, but also tying together of justification and sanctification in a Protestant perspective, but for Catholics, they're very much intertwined so my question would be is there any distinction for you or is it in like that ongoing justification is that just another word for sanctification yeah pretty much um okay. so we have your initial justification and then which is imparted on you which is you know totally forensic and that's when christ give you gives you his righteousness and you just receive it and receive all of those graces and then you have your ongoing justification, which is the same thing as sanctification. They are intertwined. Um, yeah, they're essentially one and the same, whereas Protestants make a stark distinction and we don't. And I'll just, this might help a little from the catechism 1995. It says the Holy Spirit is the master of the interior life by giving birth to the inner man. Justification entails the sanctification of his whole being. So it's it almost like sounds like what you would say like well if you're justified that entails that you will be sanctified it's just for us it's not that one and done it's like they're going together that ongoing justification and sanctification are all intertwined and you as you're being justified you're also sanct being sanctified because if you were to like not show those fruits of being sanctified um then it's or you're just completely like doing whatever you want like then you're probably not ongoing like being justified um if someone's not living a christian life and not you know trying to follow god and you're not seeing that sanctification then like they're also rejecting that justification that graces of the justification that they have received when they were baptized so that's not happening so you should the two are like you know are going together um yeah i, I think a difference would be that i would see justification and sanctification half to accompany each other whereas I guess for you sanctification would not necessarily need to accompany initial justification like someone could be baptized as a baby have that initial justification but never believe in God or have a, live a Christian life at all so that sanctification and justification are not linked at all initial justification no but ongoing justification yes um and the That's, ongoing justification is occurring through sacraments sacraments yes um it's okay. ongoing through you first of all you continually every day putting your faith in christ um and that grace cooperating with that grace that is within you to do good works and um that you know was given to you through that um initial justification in your baptism and receiving the sacraments, living the Christian life, it's all through that, that you are continually justified slash sanctified. Um, and all of that comes, though, from that initial, like, the grace from God. It's only possible through grace. So those works, like, apart from that grace of God are not going to do anything for you. <laughs> so, yeah. So I guess naturally, obviously justification salvation um you know we talked about protestants using the term being saved uh would you agree though that salvation means being saved from sin so then if that's the case how is initial justification distinct from final salvation 
Right. So like, yes, I would say you're saved from sin in -hmm. your initial justification in the sense, but not in the sense that Protestants would think. Um, Because of our initial justification, we are no longer doomed to die in sin and separated from God. Because without that initial justification, which by ordinary means comes through your baptism, but of course there's that baptism by desire that you can have if you don't ever receive it or don't have the opportunity. Um, Without that, like there's just no, like because we're born, we do believe we're born separated from God as sinners. Um, And we're not just saved as soon as we're born. Like all humans, we are doomed to die um, until we are made right with God. And the way that we are made right and by God is through that um, initial justification. And then you are made right with God, but it's like you're giving those graces and the opportunity to do so. But it's something that you have to continue to live in and cooperate with the grace that God gives you. You can't just, you know, initially be justified and saved and then just grow up and do whatever you want and not receive that grace and cooperate with that grace because a lot of it is the free will of man um yeah it's not something that's you know forced upon us um so in a way like yeah i would say i think the catechism catechism even says that like in your um but ongoing like we're continually being saved every day we would say too it's like all three i always hear that like we are saved we are at once saved continually saved and um like we were saved yeah uh for catholics it's kind of all in one and you're just continually you're living that and you at any point can just reject that um and decide you don't want to anymore and then those graces can just die within you you know um so yes but not in the same way um, and I would say, if we want to read from the catechism, um, article 1993, justification establish- establishes cooperation between God's grace and man's freedom. A man's part is expressed by the assent of faith to the word of God, which invites him to conversion and then the cooperation of charity with the prompting of the Holy Spirit who proceeds and preserves his assent. Uh, Yeah. So someone who experiences initial justification could wind up in hell. Yes, they could okay. just reject that. Um, I think you would even say and then the same. Since it's a continual process then, so it could like, oh, yesterday I wasn't a Christian. Today I am. Tomorrow I might not be. It's not really going to go like that because I think it does take much more of a decision of like, sure, I am going to make the decision to just like leave um and i think like the question because like mortal sin yeah that can like cut you off from the grace of god but like when you have that strong like you want you're that repentance like of course then you go to confession you're made right before god again um you like god that that's what god works through but obviously if you commit a mortal sin and you're like very much like repentant and sorrowful for that and so you like die before you get to confession which you know i think i said like that doesn't mean god's gonna look at you and be like well you're not a christian like you clearly like no that's just the ordinary you died on a technicality (laughs) yeah that would suck um (laughs) but that's 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 definitely not how it works so it's not as simple as like oh you could be a christian and then you could decide like no um one day and then the next day like that's just not how that would work um because like i think you both you and i know when you like commit yourself to jesus and like this is what you're doing it's not something you're gonna be like do 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 like all over the place wishy washy on there and yeah um i think whenever i've seen someone leave the catholic faith or like leave the protestant faith or like just denounce the faith it's like a um Mm -hmm. and they can't come back um Mm -hmm. But they would have to, in the Catholic view, like receive the sacraments and receive confession and so on and so forth and all of that. Um, well, they have to be rebaptized. They have that desire to come back if they died with that somehow before. But yeah. But well, they have to be rebaptized or no? Because no, it, uh, commun- uh, confession confession would okay. just that all right again. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So then, along with this, you so. You can lose your 
ongoing justification, but not necessarily your initial justification. Yeah, because that's just freely given to you. Um, so you're once a Catholic, always a Catholic on your soul, but you can just reject that and then end up in Got hell. Okay. Um, and you can like receive, have that ongoing justification your whole life and then make a decision that you want to leave and like mortally sin and then leave the church and leave living a Christian life. Um, and technically like, yeah, like lose that. And then you can come back and regain that ongoing justification, like gain your righteousness. I wouldn't say righteousness before God, but like come back into mm -hmm. living into those graces that you received um, and be ma made right with God again, which I've seen many, many, many a time. Um, and I'd mm -hmm. say that the cast, your view and my view both leave room for that. It just like what is mm -hmm. happening, happening internally, we yeah. would see as different. Mm -hmm. so what would then be the basis of that initial justification because like you were saying i mean unless you're an adult like being confirmed in the catholic church but ordinarily it would be an infant who's not capable of like placing <laughs> faith in jesus and understanding and doing all of that so what would then be the basis of that initial justification yeah. So that's in your baptism. And that's like simply by grace from God that that's received. Um, and then, you know, your parents, they promise to raise you in the faith. Um, and the only reason you're there is based on the faith of your parents. Um, but that's why justification for us is ongoing because you receive that, but then you have to make that decision to continue to live into those graces and that like righteousness that you received from Christ to continue to live on in that. Um, so it is by our faith. Um, that ongoing justification, but it's, it's an ongoing act of faith that we every day live out and commit to, um, for Catholics, justification is ongoing as man cooperates with God's grace and is sanctified and is a journey of every day, continuing on and assenting to God in that faith and cooperating with his grace. Um, and we would say that, you know, doing the good works that you do, that we do think can have merit in attributing to your salvation. It only flows from that just freely given initial grace that God has given to you because we cannot work our way to salvation. Um, the only reason our works can merit or mean anything at all is because of God's grace, which is where we would agree on that. The only reason any of us have any chance of salvation is that Jesus died for us <laughs> and mm -hmm. gives us that grace. Um, we can have merit in God's sight. Yeah. Only because of God's free plan to associate man with the work of his grace. Merit is to be ascribed in the first place to the grace of God and secondly to man's collaboration. Man's merit is due to God. Um, and we would say that no one can merit the initial grace, which is the origin of our conversion. We would see that as starting when you're an infant and then moved by the Holy Spirit. We can merit for ourselves and for others the grace is needed to attain eternal life as well as necessary temporal goods. And that's a note from the catechism. So there's no paragraph number I can give you, um, <laughs> but I can link to this whole, it's all from one like article in the catechism. If you sure. were interested in reading the, the entire thing. Um, yeah. So I would say like that initial baptism is just this free grace from God. And then the only reason that the baby is there is the faith of whoever the caregivers or whoever is taking on that they are committing to raising. And that's why godparents are so important in the Catholic church is like the parents die than the godparents traditionally like they're supposed to be which is not how it always goes um or how mm -hmm. it's been treated but they're supposed to step in and then raise commit to raising that child in the faith um and then with our free will of course we can reject those graces within us um and that salvation that god so freely offers to us and just be like man done <laughs> um yeah so i hope that makes sense um uh, mm -hmm. especially for anyone that thought maybe like catholics we thought it was entirely works-based um so i think that's that's the what that's what we face is that works based working your way to salvation because we don't believe in faith alone in the same way that protestants do whereas protestants get flack for thinking like oh you're saved and you can do whatever you want because it's by your faith catholics get the flat the flack for being like oh you have to work your way to your salvation when that's like so far from the truth, um, anyone that truly understands like God's mercy realizes that they are just nothing. <laughs> um, 
and that anything good that I do apart from initially being justified or like baptized, like doesn't do anything. Um, Mm -hmm. I think I was talking to my spiritual director Brooks about this like a while ago, and he was saying like, think of like someone that's like an atheist, like the good works that they do it like in an internal sense, like means less than the good works that a Christian does because they haven't been given that like grace or that, like, you know, like they're not justified and their works really, they don't have that faith. Like, as we say, like our works, you know, they're dead. And of course God has mercy that he can see the goodness in someone's heart if they aren't being saved in those, like, I should say ordinary means. And they, it's not to say that person can't be saved. Um, but yeah, like our works without God, separated from God, really are, they they mean less in the grand scheme of like eternity and what God can do with those works that we do. Um, like Paul says, they're filthy rags. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah, garbage. Paul, Paul. <laughs> he, yeah, he, I mean, he gives it straight, so. <laughs> One final question that I was just thinking as you were reading all the catechism is use the term a lot, merit which is, I don't think, oh, yeah. a term Protestants often use. So could right, you maybe yeah. break down what exactly yeah. that means? I mean, so this is where it comes in, where it can get like dicey because it's like, oh, you can merit your own salvation. It's like, well, yes and no. Like what I'm saying yeah. is the reason that our works, like we can do good works that help to further our sanct- our justification slash sanctification. So like the good works that we do in a way, like are saving us in a way but it's only because of that grace that god so freely offers us and like that we do them in faith of like what god has for us so like they do have an impact um on us and so yeah like that paragraph of it's our merit is first and the good works that we was first ascribed to god because he gave us the grace and that free grace to even have the ability to do those things and that they only even mean anything because of christ dying on the cross and then giving us that grace um but that's why it is different is like we do think that like our justification does flow like come from and is actively ongoing um and we're more and more infused with those virtue or those virtues grow within us that christ that were infused in us at our baptism by us like living them out and doing good works through that faith and having that faith and charity and hope and living and doing works flowing from those virtues um and then receiving the sacraments, which continue to sanctify us and give us, you know, grace and the ability to live out that Christian life. So, yeah, we there is a difference there and that we do think that mm-hmm. the good works that we do can attribute to our salvation. Um, and there is a little bit of like, yeah, that we can in some way like merit, but it's only secondly attributed to our collaboration with God. Like I always want to emphasize, we're only cooperating and collaborating with God and the grace that He's given us. Mm-hmm. But there is a free choice that we make to like to to do those acts, um, because you can have all that grace, like you said in your initial justification, and have all the opportunity and choose not to. So you can sin your way to hell, mm-hmm. <laughs> even when you have that initial justification. Um, because you can just reject that grace with your own free will and reject all of that. Um, so that's, that is, yeah, that's what that means, which is why we have, why it's different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause I know just hearing even just the word merit. Yeah. Makes me think that in a way it's sort of God owing us salvation. Like mm. he, he owed to recognize those good works. Right. Which I think would be where. I would disagree. Yeah. And yeah, why I, see, we, I think our justification has to be faith alone because God doesn't owe us anything. You know what I mean? I would say the same thing that he didn't owe. He didn't owe um, like Jesus dying on the cross for us. Like I would agree with that, but he chose to do that. Um, and so he. Right. But the ongoing justification. Right. Which has those merits. Would there not be an element of because we're cooperating, God owes us? I think God's just honoring what he promised. I think he's, yeah, the way I would see that is he's just honoring what he promised to us of like that we're ongoing, like if we we live into that and that initial what he gave us, like he's just honoring 
that promise, that covenant that he makes with us in our baptism, if we're living into that, um, because it's what God wants um, for us to do and to be with him. And he's just honoring um, and accepting, like we're accepting that grace that he wants so much to give us and freely gives us. Um, and he's happy to then like continue to allow us to be justified and sanctified and be in heaven with him. So I, I think I just see that differently of like him owing mm -hmm. it to us because I think he's just upholding like, yeah, what he promised if we like are having our faith in him. Um, yeah. Cause even as a Catholic, like, I just think like the only reason my works mean anything is because of this just amazing grace that God gives us. And then that like, even when I really mess up or fail, like I can just go to confession and God just like freely gives that. And it's, we're very much like recognizing that we don't deserve it at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like even the opportunity to be good and to choose those things. Um, so yeah, I guess I just, I don't really see, I wouldn't see it in the same way, but I, I definitely can see how it can be interpreted that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why, because obviously there's a cooperation that I would right. totally assent to when it comes to our sanctification. I think the difference would be that I view that more as like the parent child relationship, right? And my, my status of being a child of being adopted doesn't change regardless of how much I mess up or how well I'm cooperating. That status doesn't change unless I say I am no longer your child. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's kind of the same for Catholics, though, too. Like you, when you commit those mortal sins, like you are making the decision in that moment, like, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't, whatever. And then if you actually have sincere repentance and sorrow for those things, um, and then receive confession, which, like, oh my, I, I don't know how many times, times I like have to emphasize, but just like, just even like desiring that say you were to die before like god would honor that um so it's mm -hmm. like similar it's like we you really you still make the choice that you would want to go against what god wants or like offend him in that way um that's why with mortal sins you have to freely and fully understand what you're doing when you do it mm -hmm. and that's what makes it a mortal sin if you commit a mortal sin and you don't realize or know that it's a grave matter and you, or you don't do it with completely with free will or then it's not a mortal sin. It's a venial sin and you're not, you're still a Christian and in God's eyes. So it's still very much a choice that you make. Um, if you decide, I don't want to be, a, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to follow God. Um, I don't want to be live into this, this grace God gave me. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I guess I just see it. I'd see it in a different way. Um, ours just involves that you would, you know, go to confession. Whereas Megan, it would be yeah. like, you just need to have repentance for your sins and not continue on in sin unrepentantly. Because that's a sign that I would say that you're not a Christian, I would say, maybe. Mm -hmm. Then it gets mm -hmm. a little dicey, though, with if you believe in eternal yeah. security. And then, yeah. Different convo. Then. All right. One, one final, final thing. Yeah. As Catholics, then, do you view Protestants as only having that ongoing justification and missing out on that initial justification? No, um, I don't think so, because, like I said, like, there are those ordinary means in the way we would say God, like, prescribes. I say you can't okay. have ongoing without the initial. You need the initial, so okay. you would receive that, um... either through I would say unordinary like, means <laughs> yeah unordinary means by that declaration of faith and then you are baptized and even if like we would say you think something different is happening there you are being baptized mm -hmm. so that's why when you join the catholic church you don't have to be rebaptized. if you're baptized in a christian church you're baptized and mm -hmm. then you go you have to receive your um first communion and your first confession and all of those, your confirmation and all of those. That's why when someone comes into the church the first time, the Catholic church, let's say they're coming from, I was someone's godmother that came into the Catholic church from a Protestant church. She didn't have to be rebaptized. She just had to be um, given the other sacraments that Protestant churches don't have in the same way. 
Um, mm-hmm. So no, we'd still honor and recognize your baptism. Um, and I would say if there's someone that goes on and like they have that, they are baptized or they aren't baptized. Say they just commit themselves themselves to Christ and they never get baptized. Um, they would probably be recognized and saved through that baptism of desire. Like God would honor and know that they follow him and profess faith in him. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Very uh, complex topic in is, a tight and we did our best. hour. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we did our best to uh, cover it uh, because it can be a little tricky. <laughs> yeah. It's very complicated obviously people have written books on this argued about this it anytime you get into theology which i think is why theology is so fun is it could just go so deep (laughs) oh yeah um and this was just our attempt as lay lay non-theologian people to uh try to tackle this topic and (laughs) that everyone kept asking for (laughs) come to an understanding um, I wouldn't have to be, would I have to be rebaptized if I came into a Protestant church? Does it so. depend on the church? Maybe. Um, but like if you're baptized as a baby, like say you're Lutheran or Presbyterian or something, and then you decide you want to be Baptist, you don't have to be rebaptized. <laughs> mm. What if some people do? I yeah, you know, I decided I wanted to be a Baptist. I they probably some people do yeah interesting i'll have to ask gavin i think they view it more as a so i had a a a professor at moody he described it more as a um it's like a recommitment so it's like if someone is um like recommitting their vows so it would be viewed more like that versus like you know a marriage and like that initial vow right that makes sense too with that you see baptism as not a sacrament of regeneration too so it would be like different you know right Mm -hmm. very interesting well everyone let us know what topics you might want to see want to see want to see us do next and um we can do our best (laughs) yes thank you for listening let us know your thoughts yeah thanks for tuning in 